Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Signing. I'm Danny Valdez, and with us today is Senator Ted Cruz for the live signing of his new book, One Vote Away, How a Single Supreme Court Seat Can Change History. And might we mention that as of right now, this book is number one on Amazon. So excited about that. Senator, welcome, and how are you today? Danny, it's great to be with you. It's great to be with everyone uh, who's participating. And congrats on this number one. How do you feel about that? Fantastic. It, it, it's really been encouraging. The book uh, came out last week. And uh, look, it's obviously very, very timely. Um, I, I didn't plan it this way. I, I, I wrote the book this, this spring and summer uh, oh. during COVID lockdown. So I okay. was at home in Houston. I was sitting in my living room and, and pulled out the laptop and began hammering it out. Um, obviously I had no idea there was going to be a Supreme court vacancy in October, but I did know there was an election in November. And so I wrote it time to be right before the presidential election, because I think, uh, the Supreme court and our fundamental rights at the court is, is one of it, if not the most important issue before the country. Mm. And then it was kind of a perfect storm where, where it intersected with a vacancy and we're right now in the middle of the battle. Uh, to confirm Judge Barrett to the Supreme Court, which I believe will get done by the end of the month. Now, are we in your home to uh, set the stage for us? Are we in your office? Where are we? Uh, we are in my D.C. apartment. Um, I am actually on, on COVID quarantine. Uh, okay. so, um, you know, we've had, we've seen several people in the last week come down with COVID, including obviously the president, and the first lady, our, our prayers are with them. Uh, several members of the U.S. Senate, uh, one of whom is Mike Lee, who is my closest friend in the Senate. I actually talk about Mike quite a bit in the book. And Mike and I had spent a lot of time together. Mike has tested positive, and, and uh, because I spent so much time with him, the Capitol physician recommended to me that I quarantine. Sure. So I, I took a COVID test on Friday, came back negative. I'm not sick. I feel great. Oh. But I'm sitting here alone in my apartment while Heidi and the girls are back in Texas. So I'm fairly grumpy about being away from my family, but, <laughs> but glad to be with everyone here. Plenty of time to sign books, right? Uh, indeed. And I've got a stack of them right here. That's what I'm doing as, as we speak. <laughs> so for the next hour, of course, Senator Cruz is going to be signing books and answering as many of your questions as possible. And for those of you who have just tuned in and you've not yet purchased a book, you actually still have time to order an autographed copy and submit a question. Just click over to premiercollectibles.com forward slash Cruz to order a copy. And Senator Cruz, I'm curious, why did you write this book and, and why now? Well, I, I wrote it because I think the stakes in terms of the election and the court, they, they've never been higher. And, and the way the book is structured, each chapter is on a different constitutional right. So there's a chapter on free speech. There's a chapter on religious liberty. There's a chapter on the Second Amendment. Uh, there's a chapter on U.S. sovereignty. There's a chapter on democracy and elections. And, and what I do in the chapters is, is really tell war stories. So, so before I was in the Senate, I was a Supreme Court litigator. What, what I did for a living was argue cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And so in each story, what I try to do is, is take the reader inside, take the reader behind the curtain, take the reader behind the scenes. You know, a lot of folks find the court pretty confusing. I mean, they know it's important, but it's hard to know exactly what's going on or what the issues are. I, I mean, that's, this book is designed to, to help. You don't have to be a lawyer to read this book. You don't, you don't have to have any expertise at all it's really telling stories about the biggest landmark decisions at the court, uh, many of which I helped litigate. So, I, so I'm able to try to tell the behind the scenes stories of, of, of what was happening, who the litigants were, the backstory and, and why it matters for you. And, and I gotta say, Danny, it's amazing. In case after case of the big landmark cases, over and over again, they're, they're decided five to four on, on a ton of issues. Wow. We're one vote away from, right. from losing our most precious liberties. Wow. Wow. And that's really interesting to hear the perspective, hear you say that, you know, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand this. I think that's been uh, the problem, frankly, with a lot of, uh, if you will, political books is yep. that, oh, wow, I, 
I didn't go, you know, uh, six years in college. Uh, this isn't the book for me. Um, so that's really neat. Did you try to write it in a, like purposefully in a more friendly tone or personal tone? I, I, I did. And, and it's, look, I mean, let's be candid. Most politician books suck. <laughs> you could just, they're unreadable. It, 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 it's like, you know, it's just this empty pablum of I'm for truth, justice, and American pie. And, and yeah. half the time you wonder, wonder if the person who allegedly wrote it has ever even read the book, much less has any idea what's in it. Um, <laughs> right. That is not the case here. This is a book that I wrote. This is, th these are, you know, there's a component. This is my second book. So the first book I wrote several years ago was a call to time for truth. And it was really telling my life story. This is a component of doing that, but it's trying to do it on specific issues to make them come alive, to make people understand you know, it's, it's much the same thing. Earlier this year, I launched a podcast called Verdict with Ted Cruz. Oh. It, it became the number one ranked podcast in the world. And, and what we do on the podcast is try to do about 30 minutes of a deep dive on issues. And, and in the podcast, we try to take people behind the curtain in the Senate. So, so we launched it in the impeachment trial where people, again, knew it was important, but didn't necessarily understand, all right, what does all this mean? What's a high crime and misdemeanor? What, what does the constitution say? What are the facts? What's, what does Ukraine have to do with Joe Biden? And, and so what we tried to do in the podcast was get into the substance, not dumb it down. It's, 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 not, it's not at the lowest common denominator, but explain it in a way. So here's the analogy actually, Danny, I used. I said, look, if, if you, let's say you get really sick and you go to the doctor. You, you don't want the doctor to give you a diagnosis that you've gotta be a medical doctor to understand. Like if the doctor starts talking Latin and saying all this complicated stuff, you're like, dude, I don't right. know what that means. Right. But you don't want the doctor to dumb it down so much to say, okay, you've got a boo-boo. You'd like the doctor to like <laughs> tell you, all right, right, what's going on? And that's <laughs> sort of how I approach this is let's put some real substance there, but do it in a way that, that whether or not you have expertise in this area, it's understandable and makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Did any uh, any juicy uh, behind the scenes tidbits in the book? Any any revelations that you care to discuss? So there there are a lot of things uh, in in the book. Um, the first chapter of the book uh, goes through and, and and relives a little bit of the 2016 presidential campaign, and it really kind of sets the stage. Um, where, look, it was a raucous campaign. It came down on the Republican side to Donald Trump and me. Um, we both threw some really hard punches. I mean, he punched me in the face and I punched him in the face. And it was, uh, it, it, it was not gentle. Um, and, and so I kind of walk through what was going on throughout that. I, I then take folks to the uh, Republican convention in Cleveland, uh, which if you'll remember at, at that speech, um, uh, I, I did not endorse Donald Trump in that speech, and it ended up being met with a, a resounding chorus of, of boos, uh, yeah. which was a fairly surreal experience, 20,000 people. Oh, yeah. um, I take people behind the scenes on the conversations that led to that and, and, and actually what was going on. And then in the aftermath, um, the speech I gave in Cleveland was designed to try to encourage Trump to run a more conservative campaign and ultimately to be a more conservative president. In September of 2016, I made the decision to endorse him. I was impressed that he kept running as a conservative. He didn't run away from what he said. But the issue that, that was most important to me is, is what the book's all about, is, was the Supreme Court and, and Justice Scalia's vacancy. And, and in fact, the book opens the day Justice Scalia dies. That's the opening scene. I'm in debate prep in South Carolina when my body guy comes in and tells me Scalia was found dead in West Texas. The local sheriff had called us hours before the news broke. I knew that he died because he died in Texas and the sheriff let us know. Yeah. And so when I endorsed Trump, we negotiated. There were two conditions that I had for the endorsement. Number one, I wanted him to commit to the specific list of judges. He had at the time put out a list of 11 potential Supreme Court judges. 
but he'd said it wasn't an exclusive list. He'd said these 11 are the kind of people I'd appoint or anybody else on planet Earth. And, sure. and I wanted that. I wanted a, a finite universe of these are the only people that I'm going to pick. And I wanted Senator Mike Lee added to the list. And so those were the conditions that I negotiated with his campaign. They agreed. And so September, they grew the list from 11 to 21. They put that list out. They added Mike Lee to the list. And they put out in writing, these 21 and only these 21 will be the pool for Scalia's replacement. And I endorsed him within minutes of that announcement. We coordinated the two together. So I tell that, that backstory. Wow, yeah. But then I also tell the story of in November, sitting down with, with the president and, and having a pretty extended conversation. I spent four and a half hours with the president and his team where they leaned in pretty hard um, in terms of my potentially filling the Scalia vacancy. Yeah. And, and I don't want to overstate it. They didn't offer me the position, but they were leaning in hard. And, and so I walked through in the book. So I said, no, I, I don't want to be on the court. And, and, and I, I, I said, no, but I agonized over it. And so I walked through some of that agonizing. And then the next vacancy that was, that was filled by Kavanaugh, I talked with the president about that as well. I, I told him then I didn't want it. And with the most recent vacancy, uh, the president called me this summer. I forget, either June or July, he called me. I was actually out in California with my in-laws. We, we were water skiing. And so I was standing on, on a boat dock. I was in, in flip-flops and, and a swimsuit. My girls were out on the boat water skiing. And the president calls my cell and he said, Ted, I, I want to put out a new list of Supreme Court justices um, and I want to add you to the list. Can I add you to the list? And, and I told him then, I said, look, Mr. President, if, if it's helpful to add me to the list, sure, I'm, I'm happy to be on it. And if it's beneficial, if it does, if it helps, yes. Uh, but you should know I don't want the job and I wouldn't take it. And and that that's what ended wow. up happening. Wow. Yeah, I, my takeaway is when the, when the uh, caller ID comes up in your cell phone and it says POTUS, you, you hit the answer button. Does that sound right? Well, it actually comes up as, as blocked, so you don't always know it's him. And, and there's oh. some, uh, uh, so, so often he'll call, the White House will call, leave a message, and I'll call him back. That, that, okay. Uh, he calls uh, on the red phone. Huh? He calls on the red phone then, the, the secret well, bat phone. Well, so actually, mechanically, the way the president makes a phone call is kind of fun, which is he just, you know, sort of picks up the phone and says, hey, call so-and-so. Okay. And there's a switchboard at the White House that tracks you down. And they're very good. He can do it from Air Force One. He can do it from wherever. And wow. so you get a call from, from the White House switchboard saying, you know, this is, this is the White House calling. Uh, the president wants to speak to you. And you say, sure. And then they, then they put, uh, plug him in. Wow. See, that's what I love about interviews like this. I've, I've always felt these are sort of behind the scenes yeah. and similar to your book, you know, peop, you can, you can watch your favorite news source or listen to your favorite radio program. But what if you could hear from someone on the inside doing the thing? And that's, what's really neat. And I appreciate about you actually taking the time to write a book. Um, for those that don't know, uh, writing a chapter of a book is lengthy. And I mean, this is something that's going to be on record and there's a lot of work that goes into this. So I, I really appreciate, and I know people watching do as well, that you've actually, you know, put your thoughts into a book, given us a behind the scenes look, if you will. I just want to notice how special that is. And, you know, if, again, if you're, if you're just tuning in uh, as uh, Senator Cruz is uh, signing these books, he's, he's not rubber stamping. We're, we're not printing his signature in these books. He's physically signing these books and, it really is a special time in history when you can have access to people like this and hear from them rather than from a friend or from a social media post about what they believe or what they're about. So I don't want to take up too much time because a lot of questions have come in. And are you ready to take some questions from sure, people? Who I actually... am ready. And I will say on the signing, I've gone through yeah. probably a dozen Sharpies. Wearing you... So I'm sitting here yeah. cranking them out one at a time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, shall we take some questions from yeah. people who've uh, sure. bought your book? Sure. Great. And if, uh, and if you head to premiercollectibles.com forward slash cruise, you can actually still submit a question uh, to the Senator. So I want to go to Al Gott from Sandy, Utah. 
I have a 10 year old son and I want him to know how to decide for himself. What other books would you suggest he read? What should he watch? What should he attend? That's a great question. And it's a, it's a hard question. My girls are, are 12 and nine and you know, there's not a ton for kids that age. Um, you know, I do think as you, as you get older, there, there are great books, things like when I was a teenager, I love um, Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Those are, those are old for a 10 year old, um, but they're, you know, a 15 year old can handle them and certainly a 20 year old can. Um, it, uh, you know, I think reading, reading a wide variety. When I was again in high school, I read a book on the Supreme Court called The Brethren, which is by Bob Woodward, um, which fascinated me as a teenager because it it talked about the inside story of the U.S. Supreme Court and what it yeah. was like to be a law clerk. And so I think I was a sophomore in high school where I said, you know what, uh, I want to be a law clerk at the court. Wow. And, and I ended up being blessed to have that opportunity. So I talk in, in one vote away about what it's like to be a, a law clerk at the Supreme Court and, and the sort of who the justices were personally. And my boss, Chief Justice Rehnquist, was an incredible friend and mentor. I actually dedicated the book uh, to the chief. But I also tell the story of, of, of when I was offered the clerkship uh, it, it brought my father to tears. It's, it's, it's one of only two times oh, I've seen my wow. dad cry. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it, um, you know, what I would say with kids is expose them to a wide variety uh, of ideas. There, there's a book that I've read through with my girls. Uh, it's a cartoon comic book that is not really widely available anymore, but it's called How an Economy Grows and Why It Doesn't. Hmm. Um, which I've talked through with them on that. Um, but what I would say is um, they're terrific movies. I'm a big movie buff. Um, Amazing Grace is, is a fantastic movie. The, yeah. the story of William Wilberforce, who led the, was a British mem member of parliament who led the effort to ban the slave trade. And, yeah. and it's powerful. But I'll confess that actually the question, that first question is one I struggle with as a parent because I haven't found a lot of great things to, to, to give our daughters and, and it's hard. I wish there were more out there and it, it's, it's actually something, I've written two books now, I could see writing a book directed at kids because I, I haven't found a whole lot out there that's, that's helpful. That's a fair this, point. This book wouldn't work for a 10 year old, but I think, I think a high school kid or even a precocious junior high kid could, could enjoy One Vote Away. I agree with you. Some of the books I want my kids to read, I know they're not old enough to read. You know, uh, some of the books that are, you know, I've got 10 year olds and some of the books that are at their age level, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, sort of a fun way to pass the time, but I certainly can't, you know, put it in your library as something father would leave, <laughs> you know? So uh, let's go to William in New York City. If you could pass one piece of legislation immediately, what would it be? Um, so I had just introduced a bill that was called the Recovery Act that is focused on restarting the economy, getting people back to work. Um, the Recovery Act cuts taxes, it cuts regulations on small businesses, it creates incentives for more testing, um, it includes the most far-reaching school choice provisions that have ever been adopted. I'm deeply passionate about school choice. It includes $5 billion a year in federal tax credits for scholarships for kids to attend K through 12. Uh, it also includes something called the RAINS Act, which would be the most significant federal regulatory reform we've ever seen. It, it, it says that before any federal regulation can go into effect that has $100 million or more of cost on the economy, that Congress has to vote on it. So it can't just be unelected bureaucrats destroying jobs. You actually have to have people whose names on the ballot take responsibility for it. So I think the Recovery Act would be hugely consequential. Um, I also think more broadly, uh, a term limits constitutional amendment or a balanced budget amendment are both incredibly important. Those aren't legislation, they're, they're constitutional amendments, but I would put those right at the top of the list as well. 
John from Queensland. My name is John and I'm a huge fan of yours, Mr. Cruz. I'm a lawyer and my question is, with Justice Amy Barrett, how likely do you think that Roe v. Wade will be overturned? And if so, how long do you think it will take? You know, I don't know. Um, and that's, there's, there's a chapter in the book that talks about life and it, and it talks about Roe versus Wade at, at considerable length. You know, Roe was decided in 1973 and it really changed the court and it changed politics. So for 200 years in the United States, abortion had been decided at the state level. Each state legislature made decisions on abortion and different states had different, different laws, different standards. And, and under our constitution, that's how most things are meant to be decided. I mean, no one would expect Texas and California to adopt identical laws. The, the, the values and the priorities of their citizens are different. And, and sure. that's part of the beauty of 50 states in a federalist system. What the Supreme Court did in Roe is it stopped the democratic process. It declared to all 50 states, you no longer have the authority to decide this issue. It's part of the reason we see such nasty, ugly Supreme Court fights is because there's wow. no democratic outlet. Listen, I, I am pro-life. I, I believe every life should be protected uh, from conception to natural death. I also think, I recognize if, if Roe were overturned tomorrow, the result wouldn't be that abortion is illegal. Instead, the result would be it would go back to the status quo ante. It would go back to each state having authority. So for example, no one in their right mind thinks California would act to meaningfully restrict abortions. That's not where their voters are. Um, and if we wanted to see life protected, we'd have to convince our fellow citizens. That's the way the democratic process is meant to work. It's not supposed to be five lawyers in robes who say, you know, you silly voters don't get to decide. We're decreeing the rule for everyone. And, and one of the things that I outline in the book is, is I go through, uh, in particular, one case called Gonzalez versus Carhart. Uh, that is a case in which the U.S. Supreme Court considered the federal ban on partial birth abortion. Uh, partial birth abortion is, is the gruesome process through which a child is partially delivered and, and then the child's life is taken from it. And the court, by a vote of five to four, upheld the federal ban on partial birth abortion, which means there were four justices prepared to strike that down. We're one vote away from a Supreme Court that says you can have no meaningful restrictions on abortion whatsoever. You can't ban partial birth abortion. You can't ban late term abortion. You can't have laws requiring parental consent or parental notification. That's really an extreme position. And if Joe Biden is nominated justices, that's where we're headed. And so whatever your view on Roe, where the Democrats are heading is much more extreme than most Americans. And, and it's one of the many reasons why uh, the stakes in this election are so high. I have never had it explained to me. I've, I've known it, but no one has ever put it into words that we're not trying to convince kings to issue new decrees. We're trying to convince our fellow men, men, men and women to yeah. think differently. That's that's huge. That that is really well put. I appreciate you saying that. I've 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 sort of had myself, I guess, sort of a what shall the king decree mentality when it comes to politics. And I've I've just never heard it quite put that way. That's huge. Well, and it's it's one of the main themes of, of the book it is that the left has abandoned democracy. And, and and actually I traced the history of it in the book. It was the 1960s that the left made a decision, it's, it's too hard to convince our fellow citizens of their agenda. Instead, they decided we're gonna go to court and, and get five lawyers to, to just mandate the whole country has to follow what we think. And, and democracy is messy, democracy is, and by the way, in democracy, sometimes you don't win, sometimes you do. I mean, if, right. if you convince your fellow citizens you win, and if you don't, you lose. But that's how it's meant to be. And you know, one of the interesting things about our constitutional structure is it also protects diversity. Yeah. Uh, in that it recognizes that states are different and you don't have to have the identical policy outcome in every state. You can have individual citizens make choices for themselves. Right. Yeah, that's, um, 
That's, that's really well put. Uh, Benjamin asked, what was your first job after law school? First job after law school, I was a law clerk uh, for Judge J. Michael Ludig, who was a judge on the, on the Federal Court of Appeals in the Fourth Circuit. Um, and I actually talk about Judge Ludig quite a bit uh, in the book. Uh, I have a chapter on, on crime and punishment and the death penalty. And, and Judge Ludig, his father was murdered. Uh, it's a horrible story. His father was living in, in Tyler, Texas, and he was driving home with his wife and three guys followed him home, drove into his driveway, jumped out and shot him in his garage and murdered him. Wow. And, and it was, I was in law school when Judge Ludig's father was murdered. It was right after he'd hired me. And uh, they caught the guys and prosecuted him. And Judge Ludig spoke at the trials and, and he gave this victim impact statement. It's, it's one of the most powerful things I've ever read in my life. And so I reproduce a portion of it in the book where, where he yeah. talks about what it's like when your father's murdered. And, and he talks about a lot of the this, this wow. sort of small mundane details you never think about of like yeah. going and, you know, cleaning out his sock drawer, oh. um, going and, uh, uh, buying new clothes for your dad to wear in the casket yeah. and buying a new pack of underwear in a pack of three because they only sell them in packs of three. Um, he talks about the first Thanksgiving after his father was murdered, sitting by the, by the tombstone on the cold November night so that his dad wouldn't be alone on Thanksgiving. Oh. And, and it just, I, it brought me to tears when I read it and, it, and it, it's, it's a, and Judge Ludig allowed it to be published because he wanted to speak for other victims of crime who, who didn't necessarily have the ability or the platform to do so. And so he was an amazing friend and mentor and he was at the time one of the youngest federal judges in the country. When I clerked for him, he was just 41 years old. Um, and then I went the next year to clerk for Chief Justice Rehnquist on the Supreme Court and he was he was in his 70s at the time. And so they both became mentors, but they were at very different points in their career. Yeah. Wow. Well, Cynthia asks, um, and a great follow-up question, when and what made you want to be a lawyer and public servant? Um, so it was really high school. Um, There's a couple of things. One, my dad's story, my father was born in Cuba, fought in the Cuban Revolution, was, was thrown in prison and tortured when he was a teenager. And, and when he came to America, he came to Texas in 57. He was 18. He couldn't speak English. He had nothing. Uh, he washed dishes making 50 cents an hour. And, and I grew up as a kid really kind of sitting at the feet of my dad and also my aunt, my tia Sonia, who also was imprisoned and tortured in Cuba and listening to them tell stories and, and what I wanted to be, listening to tell stories of being freedom fighters. And, and it was from when I was a little kid, two, three, four, five years old, what I wanted to do was fight for freedom. That just inspired me. Um, and then that really combined with in high school, I got involved in a group, uh, a nonprofit group in Houston called the Free Enterprise Institute, where we studied free market economics and the Constitution. And, and I just, I fell in love with the Constitution. And, and so what I've wanted to do since I was a teenager was defend freedom and defend the Constitution. And, and that has really been kind of my life's focus. And I've been really blessed. I've had some amazing opportunities to, to, to do that, to be in the arena, to be fighting. Um, and so, so that's, that's what led me to be, be a lawyer and do what I'm doing now. When you were going to law school, did you have any idea you would be doing what you're actually doing now? Yes and no. Um, I, I hoped to run for office. Um, I didn't know I'd run for Senate. Um, actually, I had kind of, the plan had been that I would run for Attorney General of Texas, then run for governor, and then, then I hoped to run for president, which obviously I did in 2016. Yeah. Um, Governor was was more attractive to me than senator because being an executive, I, I 
liked the executive aspect of the job. Um, as it so happened, that's not, you know, there's an element of, of, of serendipity in, in politics and life and, and the path, the, the Senate seat opened up at a time that the governor's seat didn't. And so I ran for Senate and, and uh, astonishing everybody, we won the race. You know, when I ran for Senate in 2012, I was at 2% in the polls. I mean, nobody mm. thought I had a prayer. I'd, I'd never been elected to anything. I mean, yeah. U.S. last thing I ran for before the Senate was, was student council. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so it was, um, and, and I tell a little bit of that story, not a ton, but a little bit of that story in the book about, about running and the support. So I have a chapter on, on free speech and Citizens United, but also talk about the debates over campaign finance reform. And I bring people inside how most of what you hear about campaign finance reform is exactly backwards. Okay. That, that the campaign finance laws are passed by incumbent politicians and they benefit incumbent politicians. And they're designed to do that. The more restrictions you put on raising funds for campaigns, the more it benefits people who are already in office, who have wide name ID, who have a massive infrastructure. Um, whereas a challenger, and so I talk a little bit about how if you're running a race that no one thinks you can run and you don't have a prayer of winning, how you can raise the money to do it and how you can build a grassroots army. So that's some of what we walk through in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you who are just tuning in, you can get this book at premiercollectibles.com forward slash cruise. It's if you've been listening, uh, sounds like a very compelling book. And of course, it's autographed by the senator himself, which is very special and, in my opinion, very historic. Um, in fact, get one for yourself. Get one for your friends. Uh, these are meant great gifts. Christmas is coming. Let's go to Bryce in San Antonio, Texas. I have heard that you made a plan that you wanted to do in your life when you were 17, and you have accomplished all of your goals thus far. As a 16-year-old Texan myself, how have you managed to achieve all of your wildest goals, such as Harvard Law School or reaching high political office? Well, I, you know, I appreciate that question. I, I will say some of it is persistence. Uh, you know, I used to keep for years a, a, a file labeled failures. Okay. Um, and, and, and it's, look, if you're going to live a life of consequence, if you're going to live a life where you where you attempt to accomplish meaningful things, you're going to fail at them. And, and it's one of the things I've talked about some in this book, some in my first book, A Time to Truth, is, is the various things I've done that failed. And, and it, it determines how you succeed in life. Everyone fails. How you deal with failure, how you deal with it when, when you get kicked in the teeth makes the difference. If you give up, and stop trying, um, you, don't, you don't have the chance to accomplish great things. Look, I, I had planned, look, most 17 year old thinks, you think when you're a teenager, you know everything about the world. And, and as you grow up, you learn some of what you knew was right and some maybe not. I had actually planned as a teenager, if you asked me, my, my hope was to go make a bunch of money first, to, to, be, uh, to go be a, a gazillionaire. Um, and, and the way I thought through it at the time, I said, look, if I've made a bunch of money, then I have essentially screw you money that I can like <laughs> run the campaign I want to, and I don't have to care about donors or anything else because I've succeeded in, in business. And, and so I actually, when I was, I think, 15, I, I formed a company uh, that was called Cruise Enterprises. Um, that, that it was modeled after Stark Enterprises, which is Tony Stark, Iron Man. You know, I was a 15 yeah. year old. I was like, all right, this is going to be the, the beginning of my great business success. So and, cool. and so the company was founded. So that summer, I had been working for a water softener company in Houston and knocking on doors and, and getting leads, getting leads for salesmen to come by and sell water softeners. And so my pitch uh, was, you know, hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Would you like $20 in free groceries? And, and if, if you accepted the meeting with the salesman, you would get 20 bucks in free groceries. And so the company would pay, I forget how much they'd pay, but they'd pay 
I don't know, $10, $15 per, per uh, lead you, you had set up. So I did that for commission one summer. And then the next summer I formed the company and I hired a couple of other kids. And the other kids that I hired, I paid them an hourly rate. I think it was five bucks an hour. And my plan was, all right, and I think I had a little bit of bonus for performance, but my plan was if wow. you produce enough that I'd arbitrage the difference between the commission, I wasn't getting paid hourly. I was getting paid commission on results. Yeah. But if we produced enough, um, I'd, I'd get a benefit. At the end of the day, it turned out the kids I hired didn't work very hard. I learned about <laughs> hiring people and trying to, and, and so I basically broke even for the summer. So, so, so maybe I was not destined to be a, a mighty CEO and, and the opportunities opened up differently. What I would say on the question, Bryce, think about where you wanna be, spend a lot of time in introspection, particularly when you're young. Figure out what your passions are. What do you care deeply about? What, when you wake up in the morning, what are you thinking about? When you go to bed at night, what's the last thing on your mind? And devote your life to doing that. If you do what you love, you'll be better at it and you'll be more successful and, you, and, and you'll have a much happier life. And, and if you combine that with persistence, planning and persistence, and when you fail, pick yourself up and keep going again, that, that more often than not, uh, you know, there's an old saying that a lot of times, uh, you know, luck, luck looks an awful lot like hard work. There, there's there's mm. some truth to that. Mm, really good. Carrie from San Clemente, California. What would you change about high school graduation requirements as it relates to the true history of the United States? Hmm. You know, I worry about education. I worry about K through 12 education. I worry about college edu ed education. And, and it goes back to the 1960s. Um, I think there's a, a big divide between right and left and that the left appreciates the value of ideas. And in the 1960s, the left began seizing the organs of transmission of ideas. So the left took over K through 12 education. The left took over colleges and universities. The left took over uh, journalism. Uh, the left took over entertainment, took over Hollywood and, and movies and TV and sports and video games. On the right, what do the best and brightest on the right do? They go make money. They go to business. They go, the, the, we're not fighting on the terrain of ideas. And, and, and I worry about that because we don't think about the principles. You know, the great debate right now is the debate between free enterprise and, and socialism. Um, those of us who believe in free enterprise, most people are not even taking to the arena of ideas. Margaret Thatcher said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. That's a big part of the reason that I, that I wrote the book, yeah. was to engage in the field of ideas. Um, so I worry for a lot of K through 12 education that, that it skews hard left. And there's not a lot of countervailing. Look, I'd like to see high school graduates learn about our constitution, read, um, read about you know, Hamilton. I'm really glad Hamilton made a resurgence. It's, it's an amazing show. I've, I've watched it a couple times with my daughters. Um, it's nice to see that resurgence in our founding fathers. Um, I'd like to see high school kids at least learn some basics about free enterprise and some of the differences between free enterprise and socialism. And, and, you know, rather than even pretending to be impartial, I, I think we should instead embrace the dialectic, embrace debate. So you ought to give high school seniors that, you know, they ought to, ought to read some, some Milton Friedman and some Karl Marx and, 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 and hear yeah. from both perspectives. By the way, I, I think a lot of high school kids, I, I mean, this may, I may be, fairly biased saying this, but I think this book would be a great curriculum book uh, for kids in high school, for anyone homeschooling or anyone with high school kids. I think reading about the inside of the Supreme Court would, would make a lot of sense for a lot of students. I completely agree with that. I, I wish, you know, I, I, when I was in high school, I was giving, given zero to no exposure of real politics, of real debate. I was taught the, the three branches of government, you know, the, the standards, but the real world of the way the world works 
I had to grow up and start listening to talk shows and watching television and, and who knows what I was watching at the time, how accurate it was. So I, I appreciate books like this. Um, Russ from New Jersey, what is your advice for law students? His son, Cameron, is in his first year at Penn State Law, and he's an admirer of Mr. Cruz, and he'd like to know what advice uh, for law students you give. So I'd say take the time to understand what you're doing. Um, law school, there, there's an old line, and there's a lot of truth to it, that it's teaching you how to think. It's not, it's not just memorizing information. It's how to analyze and approach an issue. So like I had a study group in law school, some very close friends where we would sit and we'd spend hours talking about what does this case mean? What's this assignment mean? And try to, I think iron sharpens iron. Um, you know, try to really understand what's going on and why. Um, you know, when I was in law school, I used to, highlight the cases I was reading with, with six different colored highlighters. Um, and, and it would be, uh, let's see, yellow was for the facts. Uh, orange was for the procedural history. Uh, purple was for the arguments of the plaintiff. Pink was for the arguments of the defendant. And then blue was for the analysis of the courts. I guess five different highlighters. But my, my first year in law school, I was dating a woman who was uh, uh, getting her PhD in economics at MIT. And I remember being over at her, her apartment and there were a bunch of MIT PhD students there who began mocking me as a geek. And I'm literally holding five highlighters. And, and let me be clear, MIT grad <laughs> students, they be the geekiest people on the face of the earth. <laughs> and as I hold five highlighters, I realize I have no ability to defend myself. And I'm completely <laughs> like, I just said, okay, I surrender. I lose. I, <laughs> the point I'd say for the law student, I actually don't think the color coding was all that important, except what it made me do was read actively. It was good discipline for reading. Cause as I was reading, I'd try to think, all right, what color do I have to highlight this? Which wow. would make yeah. my brain say, what is this sentence doing? What's I, you know, understanding, taking it, don't treat it as memorization. Don't just, just, just read the rule of law, understand what's really going on. And, and I think that yields a lot more success in law school. Mm, that's so good. Uh, Karen from Brighton, Michigan, where do you see yourself in five years? Thank you. Um, I don't know. Um, Look, I ran for president in 2016, and we came incredibly close. I, I think it's no secret that, that, that I hope to run again. Um, I don't know when necessarily that would be, but, but uh, and I don't know what's going to happen in November. I, I hope the president is reelected. I'm, I'm working very hard to help him be reelected. Uh, but whether he is reelected or not, um, these fights aren't going away. Um, we're going to continue to have massive battles in our country over free enterprise versus socialism. We're going to have battles in our country versus rule of law and the Constitution versus violence and anarchy in the streets. And, and I'm committed to the fight. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would love it if I were a few blocks down Pennsylvania Avenue and, and in a position to be nominating Supreme Court justices myself. I don't know if I will be or not, but but. Whether or not I am, I'm, I'm committed to the fight. Aaron from Kansas City, Missouri. As a Kansan, what can Texas do to keep its conservative values and what is the cause for the increasing blue problem? Um, a great question. Uh, Texas is a battleground. It's, it's, it's much more of a, I mean, it's much more of a battleground than it used to be. Um, and I think what we've got nationally going on is there are two broad demographic trends playing out. Uh, blue collar workers, uh, a lot of union households, uh, are moving to the right. Uh, and, and that is moving Midwestern states more Republican. Uh, at the same time, suburban voters, and, and in particular, suburban women, uh, have been moving to the left. And, and that is moving big suburban states like Texas, like Georgia, like Arizona. They're getting much more purple. And it, it's really driven by the suburbs. 
what we need to do, what you need to do, what I need to do is do a much better job of reaching people's hearts and minds and explaining the blessings of liberty, uh, explaining it. I think Republicans do too much preaching to the choir. We do too much talking to the 2.6 million people watching Fox News every night. And, and, and God love them. We need to preach to the choir. But we need to do more speaking to young people, speaking to Hispanics, speaking to African-Americans, speaking to suburban moms uh, for whom these fights matter. But we're not always in. This connects to the question earlier about about ideas. And it's why I wrote the book. It's why I'm doing the podcast verdict with Ted Cruz. I'm trying to find ways to reach people who wouldn't necessarily otherwise hear why free enterprise is better than socialism, why, why the Constitution protecting free speech, religious liberty, the Second Amendment, our fundamental rights, why it's so important, because we've got to win these battlegrounds, and, and Texas is very much a battleground. Yeah. Jonah from Hayworth, Illinois. Hello, Senator. I was just curious about how someone gets into the political field. I'm currently 19, and I found a love for politics over this past year. I still have a lot to learn, but where should I start? My hopes are to either run for a seat in the Senate or the House one day. Thanks and congratulations on your new book, Jonah. Well, Jonah, thank you. Um, you know, what I'd say is get involved now. Uh, I think you said you were 19. Find an issue you care about. Find an issue you're passionate about and get involved and build a record now. Um, you know, as I thought of politics, and this is early on, like to, to run for office, to run successfully, I thought of it like three strands in a rope, that I needed skills and a record, I needed relationships, and I needed money. And, and all three were, were necessary if I was going to run for office and succeed. As I mentioned, my plan was go make a gazillion dollars early on, and then do the other two. As it so happened, a series of opportunities opened up and I made a series of choices where I didn't make much money for a long time. And in fact, I had school loans until about 10 years ago because I, my parents went bankrupt when I was in high school. So I've financially been on my own since I was 17. Um, but I ended up getting a lot of skills and, and building a record and also building a lot of relationships. And, and as I approached decisions, I tried to analyze them. How do they advance the, the skills that I need to be able to run? And one of the real virtues, if, if there's an issue you care about, go fight for it. Go move people. Go build a record so that when you run, you don't have to tell people, this is what I would do in office. You can say, you can see what I would do because of the scars I bear, because of the fights that I have. So school choice, I mentioned school choice earlier. I, I'm deeply passionate about school choice. I became very involved in school choice in my 20s, fighting for school choice as, as the civil rights issue uh, of this next century. Um, if you work on an issue you care about and you build a record, you'll, bu you'll by the way, you'll get skills, you'll build relationships, but you also have a reason to run because look, before you run for anything, you need to be able to tell someone credibly and believe it, hey, th this is why you should vote for me. This is why I think I would do a good job in this position and, and have a proven record to point to. Lamar from Tuscan, Arizona. How has the second amendment been treated differently than the other amendments? Uh, great question. Uh, so the Second Amendment, the fight it, it is really whether it, it exists or not. Um, so one of the chapters in the book is, is on the case Heller versus District of Columbia, which is really the landmark Second Amendment case. And, and what happened there, so the, the plaintiff in that case is a fellow named Dick Anthony Heller. And, and he was a federal police officer, carried a firearm at work, but under the laws in the District of Columbia, it was illegal for him to have an operative firearm at home. And so he filed a lawsuit challenging DC's laws and saying under the Second Amendment, you can't prohibit me 
keeping and bearing arms and protecting my home and my family. And the case went to the Supreme Court. Um, I was part of the team that litigated that case. So I represented Texas and 30 other states in Heller. And the central question in Heller was not, are some gun control laws sometimes permissible? That, that reasonable minds can differ on that. We can have a good and substantive debate about what gun control laws make sense or not. And that's a good public policy debate to have. But that wasn't what was at issue in Heller. Heller, the question was, does the Second Amendment protect any individual right to bear arms whatsoever? The four dissenters, their position was that the Second Amendment protects no individual right, that it only protects what's called a collective right of the militia, which is essentially fancy lawyer talk for saying a non-existent right. Yeah. If the four, lawyer, four dissenters got a fifth vote, we're one vote away from the Supreme Court saying, no American, not you, not me, none of us, has any individual right to keep and bear arms whatsoever, which would mean the federal government, the state, the local government could make it a crime, could make it a felony for you or, or me to own a gun, mm. and we would have no, no recourse. We wouldn't be able to sue. We wouldn't be able to challenge that. The dissenters were quite literally trying to erase the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights. And, and by the way, both Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden have promised to nominate justices who will vote to overturn Heller, who will vote to, to essentially remove the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights. Mm. Well, I feel, and I don't know about you guys, but like I have been to class and this has been so informative for me. Um, I, I wish I had a history teacher like you in high school or any, any teacher like you. This, is, this has truly been an honor. Unfortunately, it is all the time we have for this. So to order Senator Ted Cruz's limited edition autograph book, go to premiercollectibles.com forward slash Cruz. And to be a part of the live signing experience with more of your favorite authors, follow Premier Collectibles on Instagram or Facebook. Senator Cruz, from all of your friends who have tuned in and from all of us at Premier Collectibles, we really appreciate you being here. This has been an honor. Thank you very much. Take care. God bless. Yeah. See you, everybody. Hi. I am sitting here with the one and only Jackie Chan, global superstar, and he is signing all of these books. Are your hands tired? Uh, no. Higher, but I'm happy. All right, yeah, I'm really, so really happy, happy to hear that. How do you feel? Good, I'm excited. This is the first time I've done something like this before, a live signing. Where do I want to go that I've never been? Um, oh, we're thinking about, uh, not thinking, we're putting it in motion. I'm gonna go to Indonesia on uh, my irresponsible tour this year. I'm excited about that, I've never been. And uh, there's been a heavy demand for me there. So we're gonna go. I'm gonna go to Indonesia and I'm gonna make people laugh in Indonesia. That's how I roll. <laughs> how do you roll? <laughs> I can't make this up. Wayne, you got your Indonesia pants. I decided it uh, about a good three weeks ago. You'll see it on the schedule soon, so I suggest you go get your pants for Indonesia. Cause you're not gonna wear them stupid pants. Where do you think Indonesia is? India. Yes, we out. You can see that I'm signing it. This is not some machine scribbling my name. This is my actual human body scribbling my name. So, all right, there we go. First book, signed. We have fans from all over who have written questions that they want to ask you. Oh dear. And they're also gonna get signed copies of the book. We're so excited. Yeah. So you ready to jump into yes, some questions? Yes, yes. Hey, we're live at the live signing. To my mind, the successful feeling at the end of a book is that is not that you have done everything you could with the book, but that you scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. So it was a wonderful, yeah, it was a wonderful experience and a wonderful discipline in storytelling. I'm gonna start signing right now. I guess I'll sign in red. You know, red, I'm a Delta, red. Can you guys see that? See, he's a little smudge right there. So if you see a little smudge, that means Charles jumped on the book as I was signing it. I don't mind doing signings because people really love a signed copy of a book. I know I do. I will sometimes sign a book to myself. You were only seven weeks old and ABC really wanted to get the new host 
in that seat and get things going. And I said, but I'm breastfeeding. And by the way, that was at a point like in 1979, coming up on 1980, you really weren't even allowed to say breastfeeding on the air. I feel like this is something we kind of all need right now. My life changed after my leg was broken in 1985. Right. My world changed. I was, I had the world by the tail. I had, I had every material thing you could possibly hope for going for you in your life. And then all of a sudden, bang, in one instance, it was gone. The only thing that matters is the love you give and the love you allow yourself to receive. I'm healthier than I've ever been, only because I got healthy when I was like 40. <laughs> Thank, you so Thank you so much. Got it. Hi there, you probably recognize this guy. I'm, I'm Ned Rust, I'm his uh, publisher, James Patterson here, the uh, number one best-selling author in the world. And uh, how about- Did you just make that up? I uh, did some research before okay. I got here today. We are doing my virtual live book signing. Live book signing. This is crazy. More and more authors are doing this. I think it's so cool. Signing uh, some of the signed copies that you guys can get at premiercollectibles.com. You're gonna be signing these books yes, live I over the next be. 45 minutes. Hey, what up, this is your boy. Oh, I'm watching sign. myself. Look at that, I need to stop. You're OCD. How, is this panic inducing to They're you? They're not like, watching all you. these. They got uh, a bag. Yeah. Yeah. I'm inspired by your success. What advice do you give someone who's never found his passion? Hi, I'm Judge Janine Pirro. You probably heard of my book, Liars, Liberals, and Leakers. <laughs> I may look like Greg Gutfeld, but I'm not actually. This is so exciting. My eighth book, The Gutfeld Monologues, is out. This is fantastic. If you haven't purchased it yet, you're dead to me. But you still have time to reanimate and become my best friend. Biggest pet peeve. Yeah. Um, men that talk to me with spinach in their teeth. What can I do while at work to help lower my stress and improve my health? What musician do you most admire? I love you all and we'll talk again soon. Take care. Bye. Much love. See ya. See you soon. Everybody. Bye. 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 We'll see you around the world. Woo! Have a great day. Thank you everyone here. Bye guys. Say goodbye Mary. See you in the morning. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm gonna go get drunk. <laughs>